Good morning, Kalimera says. As all of you are aware or should be aware, this weekend is our spiritual odyssey weekend. Every year during Great Lent, we have this weekend and we bring speakers to present on special topics to our community and to the communities in the Bay Area. This weekend, we invited the, the very Reverend Dr. Nathaniel Simeonidis, who is the Ecumenical Officer for the Archdiocese of America, as well as the intra and interfaith representative to the Assembly of Canonical Bishops in America, all of the Orthodox bishops in America, and also interfaces with the Ecumenical Patriarchy. I've asked Father Simeonidis to offer the homily this morning. His talks yesterday were of great value to all of us who attended on the three topics that all three focus on the work of orthodoxy in the world, in this country, and especially amongst all of us as Orthodox Christians and all of the Orthodox jurisdictions in America. I know that his message this morning will be timely and inspired, and I ask that you pay close attention to that which he offers us this morning in meditation of the scriptures and of the feast during Great Lent. Είναι μεγάλη ευλογία για μένα να βρίσκομαι ανάμεσά σας σήμερα αυτή την δεύτερη Κυριακή της νηστείας. Να δοξάζουμε μαζί το Θεό με μια φωνή, αυτόν τον Θεό που μας έπλασε και μας αγάπησε τόσο πολύ στο σημείο που έδωσε την ίδια Του τη ζωή για μας. Και ήρθαμε να γιορτάσουμε και τη μνήμη του Αγίου Γρηγορίου του Παλαμά ένας Αρχιεπίσκοπος της Θεσσαλονίκης, ένας μεγάλος πατέρας της Εκκλησίας, ο οποίος ήταν άνθρωπος προσευχής και αγάπης. Και το μήνυμα του Αγίου Γρηγορίου για όλους μας σήμερα είναι να είμαστε άνθρωποι αγάπης και προσευχής, ούτως ώστε όταν ο κόσμος μας βλέπει έξω στον δρόμο, να μην βλέπει απλώς έναν άλλον άνθρωπο, έναν συνηθισμένο άνθρωπο, αλλά να βλέπει την εικόνα του Θεού. Και όπως εμείς βλέπουμε στους στίχους αυτού του ναού τις ωραίες αυτές εικόνες και θυμόμαστε τον Κύριό μας να είμαστε και εμείς τέτοιες εικόνες για τον κόσμο, να θυμούνται και αυτοί ότι υπάρχει Θεός, υπάρχει ελπίδα και υπάρχει αγάπη. I call about 10 or 12 years ago, I gave my first sermon ever as a seminarian here at the Church of the Holy Cross in Belmont, California. And I came here with my dear classmate and friend, Constantine, <laughs> who always stands back in that corner and continues to do that with his mom and often with his sister and family. That's their corner near St. John Maximovich. And so when I came here back in 2001, I was terrified. I didn't know what to say. I had no clue who I would find in front of me. And I, I don't even remember what I said. And thank God, no one remembers what I said back then. But now, having come and visited your beautiful community and having been with you this week for about seven, eight days, but. And now my seventh visit to Belmont, I feel at home. I feel like I can look out to each and every one of you and, and know you. And they say sometimes the best sermons are those that are given and delivered to people that you know and for people that you know. And I feel that our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ makes us a family. Today we gather to celebrate the feast of St. Gregory Palamas, the Archbishop of Thessaloniki. And if we visit Thessaloniki in northern Greece, the, the cathedral church is dedicated to St. Gregory. And we can go in and visit and venerate his relic. 
Just as you can venerate St. John Maximovich in San Francisco, you can go to the Saloniki and touch and kiss St. Gregory. And St. Gregory was a man who was peaceful, a man who was known for his theology, a man who is still studied today for his theology, but most importantly, he was a man who was known for his prayer. He was a man who would pray and be still. And while the world around him was turning, and there was turmoil in Thessaloniki, while there were attacks on the city, Saint John, Saint Gregory was able to focus and to focus on Christ. Today, we're surrounded by similar distractions. The world is still turning, there's still turmoil. We turn on the television and we hear about the missing plane. We hear about the crisis in Ukraine, in Crimea, and we worry. But distractions don't only exist out there, so far away from us. They're all over. When I walked into the church for the first time this week, I noticed the beautiful icons, the candles, and I also noticed the sign that says, please turn off your cell phones. And we have to remember to turn off our cell phones even when we come into church. Distractions are everywhere. We hear our phones ring and we look. We get a message and we look. We have icons and apps on our phone, notifications, we look. We start wearing these, no these distractions now more and more. People wear watches that buzz, that keep track of them. And pretty soon, trust me, we'll have them embedded in us. Distractions, distractions, distractions. And as we said, they're not uncommon. And we shouldn't be worried about distractions. We shouldn't be hard on ourselves if we can't focus. It's normal, it's natural to be distracted. We have minds that wander. And there's so many things that fight for our minds and our hearts. Saint Isaac the Syrian, a father of the early church, an ascetic, who has written beautiful poems and homilies. In one of his homilies, talking about prayer, says to us, don't worry if you cannot focus while you pray. Saint Gregory Palamas was able to do that, to focus, to gather his heart and his mind in that moment. But that was a gift. That was a gift from God and was not something that he attained on his own. And so St. Isaac says to us, don't worry if while you're praying, you're distracted. Don't worry if you hear a child cry and you get distracted. Don't worry if someone in front of you is speaking and you get distracted. Don't worry if a child throws something or says something and you get distracted. If you think of something and your mind wanders, don't worry. He says, this is normal. This is to be expected. And he goes on and he says, prayer, however, when it's off a little bit and we get distracted, it's important that we do our best to focus on positive things. That if our minds wander, let them wander on the gospel. Let them wander on beautiful things. Let them wander on God's creation. And if by chance they wander on those negative things, come back. Don't dwell in them, he says. Don't dwell in the negative, but dwell on the positive. Find the positive around you, he says, and, and focus on those. And let them guide your prayer. And so we come to the holy space, the holy church, 
and in particular this beautiful holy church, to worship and to pray. And it is not by chance that we have icons on our churches and in our churches. Back in 2001 when I visited, the walls were bare. The walls were gray. If you looked around and your mind wandered, it wandered into the abyss. 10 or 12 years later, I, I moved because when I look around, I feel like I'm enveloped by heaven. I feel like I'm part of, that I'm part of God, that God is with us. And if my mind wanders in this beautiful space, I don't worry because chances are I'm going to look at something and be reminded of something beautiful, of something positive. I'll think of God. You have made this happen, each and every one of you, through your prayers, your efforts, your offerings. And it's a testament of your love. It's a testament of beauty and of order that exists in the church when we're with Christ. In the book of Exodus, we know that the people of Israel were liberated, were freed from Egypt. And they wander in the deserts for 40 years. And while they were wandering, they needed a place to pray, to worship, to be with God. And God sends instructions, the blueprint to Moses. And he teaches him and says to him how he should build a tabernacle a tent, a movable tent in which the people would dwell, would come together and there God would come and be with them. And so Moses receives the blueprints and if you read Exodus it is a blueprint. He says exactly what it should look like, how big it should be, what color the tent should be, what should go into the tent, when the tent should move. And Moses realizes that in order to build this, he needs everyone to be part of this building project. So he calls the elders, he calls the contractors of the time, and he gives them the instructions. And he invites all the people to come and to make an offering, to give. And this is, of course, the beginning of the tithing, to give 10% of the first fruits to God to build a tabernacle and it goes on and it talks about what happens when the people are united when the people have faith when they have a common vision when they love each other when they love God there's a moment when the elders are collecting the offerings that they come to Moses and they start complaining and we would think that they're complaining because people are not giving enough. Give more, give more, we think they would say to Moses. We need more. But the opposite happens. The elders complained to Moses because there was too much. People were coming and giving too much. They went far beyond what was expected of them because they had love. They worked together and they had an abundance of goods collected. This is what has happened here. This is what is happening here. When there is love and harmony, when there is a common vision, a common mission, when we work together in tandem, we have an abundance an abundance of God's presence. This is a testament of your love and your dedication. This is now a place where you and your friends and your family members can come and be with God. You have made this possible. 
And when you go out from this place, I know for sure that you have changed, that you are different. We each come in here as men and women, children, and we leave here as children of God. We come in here as ordinary citizens and we leave here as holy people. And when people go outside and see us, they see these icons on the wall. We become icons. We come and take in God and we become holy. And we become holy for the world and we're called to save the world, to be living icons. Icons are not just meant to sit on these walls and look pretty. They're meant to be living. We're meant to be like Saint Gregory Palamas, peaceful, prayerful, loving, images of God, so that when people see us, they see something different in the world. They don't just see an ordinary person. They see something unique. And by chance, they may approach the light that's in us and ask and come and see. And as they come and see, they too will be transformed. That is my prayer for this community, to continue to grow, to con continue to transform Belmont. So that Belmont is not just any little old point on a map, but Belmont becomes a holy city through its holy people. Amen.